Hello and welcome to this online training session on medical emergencies hosted by Paramedical Services, a recognized training organization with nationally recognized ASQA accredited courses. In this training session, we will be discussing the different types of medical emergencies. This is a vital component of HLT AID 003, Provide First Aid, and HLT AID 004, Provide an Emergency First Aid Response in an Education and Care Setting. In overview of the online training session, the topics that will be discussed today include priorities of first aid in an emergency. This includes conducting our primary survey or our DRS ABCD, then conducting a secondary assessment and assessing the patient's vital signs. Next, we will have a look at how to recognize an upper airway obstruction or when somebody is choking and how to manage that appropriately. Following that, we will have an in-depth look at asthma and anaphylaxis. Because this is an ever-growing problem in our community, everybody needs to have a good understanding and be aware of how to recognize these two conditions and how to manage them appropriately. To conclude, we will have a look at other types of medical emergencies, how to recognize them and how to manage them. Starting with our primary survey, we use our DRS ABCD or Doctor's ABCD approach. When approaching any person who is ill or injured, it's important that we approach the scene and we look for any danger. Once we know that the scene is safe, then we try to elicit a response. This will give us an indication if somebody is conscious, semi-conscious or unconscious. The next thing to do is send for help. This may include just calling on your colleagues for help, calling for a parent if you're in a childcare facility or other supervisor, or calling for an ambulance service using the number 000 on the landline and 112 on mobiles. The next thing to do is to check the person's airway. We want to make sure that the airway is open and it's clear. Once we have completed that, we check breathing. We want to know are they breathing normally or are they breathing inadequately. Now what we've learned from our CPR video and training is that if somebody is not breathing or not breathing adequately, we need to start compressions or CPR. However, if somebody is breathing adequately, then we do not start compressions, but we can check their circulation. Feeling for a pulse on a person can be quite difficult. So another way of checking somebody's circulation is looking at their coloring. If somebody is looking very, very pale, their circulation is quite poor. However, if somebody is looking their normal skin tone, we know that their circulation is good. D stands for defibrillation when we're doing CPR, but D can also be interchanged for looking for things such as deformities or injuries to the body. Once we've conducted our primary assessment, we then move on to the secondary assessment. This is when we systematically look at a person from their head to their toes looking for any other types of injuries that could be life-threatening, such as life-threatening bleeding or head injuries, or looking for any other abnormalities on their body to report to the emergency services when they arrive. In the head-to-toe assessment, we start by looking at the head, checking the person's face and the top and back of their head, moving down to the neck, the chest area, the abdomen, the pelvis, the lower extremities, so the legs, and the upper extremities, the arms. And then if you feel comfortable, you can roll the patient onto their side to assess their back. Ensure to gain consent from any patient that is conscious. And remember that with the child or the infant, we need to gain consent from a parent or a caregiver. If you do work in a childcare facility, this permission has already been granted you when the child enters your care. Always be mindful and respectful towards the patient and be aware of different cultural and spiritual beliefs. When monitoring a patient's vital signs, check their breathing rate. Watch and take note if they're breathing too fast or too slow. Please be aware that the breathing rate for infants is much higher than that of children, older children and of adults. So if you do see a child or an infant breathing rather rapidly compared to an adult, don't be alarmed because this could be very normal for them. Also, please note here that the pulse rate for a newborn, an infant or a child are much higher than that of older children and adults. Watch for skin color changes as well as the patient's level of consciousness. 
This will help you to recognize if the patient's condition is improving or worsening. Vital signs give us a window into what's happening inside the patient and it can assist the paramedics on arrival when we do our handover. The first medical emergency we're going to have a look at is choking. An upper airway obstruction can either be a partial obstruction or a total obstruction. The partial obstruction will show signs and symptoms such as wheezing, and that's the whistling sound that you hear when air rushes past that obstructed object. Difficulty in breathing. The patient may be coughing or having spasms in the upper throat or the upper airway, and they could be showing signs of anxiety or distress. Now, when there's a total obstruction, the patient will be unable to talk, unable to breathe, because the obstruction is completely blocking the airway and they're unable to get air in or out. They may be clutching at their throat. They could lose consciousness because of the lack of oxygen getting up to the brain. And they could start going blue around the lips and the mouth. This is called cyanosis. Cyan is the color blue. And this is caused by a lack of oxygen in the blood and it shows very, very well up around the mouth area. So look for signs and symptoms of this. When managing the choking patient, if they're of a good conscious level, try and encourage them to cough. When doing this, use gravity to assist the removal of the object. So position the patient either leaning forward on a desk or supporting them in your arm. On the child who's small enough to do so and the infant, you can sit down and support the child over your legs, holding the jaw area, tilting their head downwards. This will help us when we're administering the back slaps to use gravity to help remove that object. We administer five back slaps between the shoulders in an upward motion using the heel of the hand. If the five back slaps are unsuccessful, then we can try to do five chest thrusts. This will be demonstrated in your practical training sessions and you will have ample time to practice this in scenarios. If at any point the casualty becomes unconscious, start CPR immediately and follow your normal DRS ABCD CPR routine. Asthma is a very common medical condition out there in the community and this can occur in infants, children and in adults. Asthma is a lower airway condition where there is spasming of the airways, narrowing of the airways, and a mucus plug that blocks air from going in and out of the lungs. So if we have a look at the picture down at the bottom end of the screen over here, this is what a normal airway looks like. And these are the very small airways right down in the bottom of the lungs that deliver air down to the tiny air sacs. When somebody is having an asthma attack, we get that narrowing of the airway, the thickening of the wall, we get the spasming occurring, and the mucus plugging that area over there. So you can see it would be very difficult for air to pass down to those small little air sacs in the asthmatic patient during an asthma attack than it would in the normal airway. It's good to be aware of what common triggers are of asthma and what causes certain people to have an asthma attack so we can try and remove them from risks or triggers in the childcare facilities or in the workplace. Asthma can be triggered by things such as smoking or fumes, exercise, colds and flus, different types of pollen, dust mites, animal fur, rapid changes in weather, and smoke. When somebody has an asthma attack, they can either have a mild attack, a moderate, or a severe attack. Having a look at the signs and symptoms of the mild attack, the patient may be coughing, may have some possible wheezing, slightly distressed, they could be complaining of a tight feeling in their chest, tiredness, and they're able to speak in full sentences. The moderate case, there could be a persistent cough, an audible wheeze that you can hear when the patient breathes in or out. They could be complaining of difficulty of breathing and a tightness in their chest. And in this case, they may not be able to speak in full sentences, but they'll be speaking in words between each breath. Children may complain of abdominal pain due to difficulty in breathing, so be aware of this sign. In this severe asthma attack, you may or may not hear a wheeze, but the patient will be very distressed and they will be using muscles of their neck and chest to breathe. 
Because of this patient fighting for breath or struggling to breathe, they may have difficulty in speaking just in words. The patient may become very pale or that blue color cyanosis around the mouth and the face and the fingertips. Because the patient's struggling to breathe for such a long time, they can get very tired, which can lead to unconsciousness and respiratory arrest, meaning that the patient would stop breathing. Please note here the words colored in red. This is one of the easiest ways to figure out whether somebody is having a mild, moderate or severe. In the mild attack, the patient is able to speak in full sentences as normal. In the moderate, they'll find that they have to take a few breaths during the sentence, but they can still be able to speak in words. And in the severe attack, because of the difficulty in breathing, the patient may only be able to get one word in between each breath. There's a large variety of asthma medications out there which help the asthmatic patient keep their asthma under control or which also help to relieve the signs and symptoms when they're having an asthma attack. Asthma medication falls into three broad categories. Relievers, which relieve the signs and symptoms of the asthma attack. Preventers, which help to prevent an asthma attack from occurring. And symptom controllers, which also aid in prevention. Note that in an emergency, only a reliever will work because it's there to relieve the signs and symptoms of the asthma attack. The reliever is a blue-gray color, like shown in the picture on the right-hand side over here. It works very quickly by relieving the muscle spasms in the airway and allowing air to go in and out of the lungs again. Reliever medications can be labeled Asmol, Ventolin, which is one of the most common ones, Aeromir, and Braconil. You may very commonly see people using a spacer device with their asthma puffer. This should always be made available in childcare facilities or with any children or infants that require to use an asthma puffer. The reason for this is that the spacer increases the amount of medication that can get down to the lungs it's a lot easier to use for any person who is experiencing an asthma attack and it reduces the amount of medication that stays in the mouth or the throat. There are many different types of spaces out there and they are all very easy and straightforward to use. During your practical training and assessment, you will have the opportunity to view different types of spaces and have a practice in using them. When providing your first aid management of the patient experiencing an asthma attack, we always follow our DRS ABCD. So check for danger, assess the response, send for help, check the airway, the breathing, circulation, and for any deformity. Posture the patient sitting upright and slightly leaning forward. This makes it much easier for them to breathe. Monitor their condition, give reassurance, and assist the patient with their reliever medication. If in a childcare facility or with any person that has an asthma action plan, consult the asthma action plan, which we will see on the next page, which helps you go through a step-by-step -step approach to managing the patient's condition. If there is no asthma action plan available, proceed with the emergency management of asthma. Remove the cap and shake the inhaler well. Attach the inhaler to the spacer. Many adults don't need or require the use of the spacer. They're quite comfortable using the puffer on their own. Ask the patient to try and breathe out gently. Hold the inhaler and the spacer upright and insert the mouthpiece into the mouth, getting the patient to seal their lips around the mouthpiece. Ask the patient to breathe in and fire one puff of medication. Ask the patient to hold the medication in their lungs as long as they possibly can and then take four normal breaths before repeating the process. This process can re be repeated four times, so all in all the patient receives four puffs of medication. Then wait four minutes and repeat if needed or if stated on the asthma action plan. This is called the 4x4x4 four by four by four process. So just to repeat that, it's one puff four normal breaths, repeat the process four times, and then wait for four minutes to allow the medication to work. If needed, you can repeat this process. 
This is what an asthma action plan may look like. An asthma action plan can help you stay calm in an emergency and help you to follow the step-by-step -step approach to effectively treating the person. So please be aware that if you work in a childcare or school facility or if you have school-going children who have asthma, they need to get a signed asthma action plan from their doctor and this should be given into the school or childcare facility to be able to follow in the event of an emergency. In the face-to-face -face training and practical assessment, you will get the opportunity to put your skills and knowledge into practice in the form of an asthma scenario. Those of you who are doing HLT AID 004 provide emergency first aid response in an education and care setting. You will have the opportunity to complete an asthma risk assessment and management plan. This helps you to identify the person at risk, identify the risks and triggers of the asthma, assess these risks, implement strategies to minimize this, determine the location of medication and action plans, communicate the policies and procedures to all staff, and implement the new policies, as well as monitoring and reviewing the policies. And please keep in mind, these action plans can be used in the workplace as well as the school or childcare setting. It helps the first aider or care provider to treat the asthmatic patient safely and effectively by using a step-by-step -step treatment plan. Next, we're going to have a look at allergic reactions. An allergy is when the immune system reacts to something in the environment, which usually is harmless to most people. Most common allergic reactions are due to things such as medicines, food, including eggs, cow's milk, peanuts, tree nuts, seafood, sesame, soy, fish, and wheat. Allergic reactions can also be caused by insect bites and stings, mold, pollen, dust mites, and other products such as latex. Mild reactions can lead to a condition called anaphylaxis, which is a whole body severe allergic reaction. Depending on the type of allergen and where it comes into contact with the body or enters the body, the patient may experience different signs and symptoms. Mild to moderate symptoms can include anything from a runny or itchy nose, watery eyes, sneezing, abdominal pain and vomiting. However, please be aware here that if there is an insect bite that has caused this abdominal pain or vomiting, this is actually classified as a severe reaction. A patient could experience dry, red, itchy skin, hives or welts on the skin, and swelling of the face, lips, and or eyes, and or any area of the body that has been affected. And allergic reactions could result in somebody having an asthma attack, as we've mentioned in the previous slides. When managing an allergic reaction, it's important that we identify a person who could be at risk of allergic reactions. If possible, minimize the risk. For example, in a childcare setting or in the workplace, if somebody was highly allergic to mold, to minimize the risk, we ensure that they are either working or playing in an area that is mold free. And for those of you who are doing HLT AID 004, provide emergency first aid response in an education and care setting. Ensure that you have a good communication plan in place among staff recognize the signs and symptoms of allergic reaction early and obtain the child's action plan and follow that action plan. On the right hand side of the page here, we have an example of what the ASEA action plan looks like. ASEA stands for the Australian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy. They have developed an action plan for those people who are at risk of having allergic reactions or severe allergic reactions called anaphylaxis. The ASEA Action Plan should have all the patient's details on it, a photograph of the patient which makes it easy to identify them, as well as being signed by the patient's doctor or nurse practitioner. The Action Plan helps you to recognize the signs and symptoms of a mild to moderate allergic reaction and gives you instructions in a step-by-step -step format on how to manage the person's allergic reaction. These are very helpful to have in the childcare or school setting as well as in the workplace. Anaphylaxis is a whole body severe allergic reaction that can be life-threatening. 
It causes rapid swelling of the upper airway, causing respiratory and cardiovascular distress. It's a serious condition that requires immediate life-saving medication. Some of the most frequent allergens that cause anaphylaxis are peanuts, shellfish, insect stings, and drugs or medications. Some of the most common signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis could be lightheadedness, drowsiness or loss of consciousness, shortness of breath with wheezing, stridor and coughing. If there's been an insect bite or sting, somebody could be having abdominal pain, vomiting and diarrhea. There could be hives and itchiness and redness on the skin. The person could start swelling in their face, showing signs of swelling on the lips, the tongue, the throat and the eyes. And they could start showing signs and symptoms of shock from their blood pressure dropping. When managing the anaphylactic reaction, we need to follow our DRS ABCD. So assess for danger, response, send for help and call for an ambulance. Assess the patient's airway, breathing and circulation. Obtain the medications and the action plan. Follow the directions of the action plan and determine which is the appropriate response needed for the type of reaction you are witnessing on the patient. Position the patient laying or half seated so that medication can be delivered. Remove any stinger if stung by a bee. Use the auto ejector where indicated on the action plan. The auto ejector should be given quickly before starting CPR if the patient is unresponsive, unconscious, not breathing or not breathing normally and has the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. Further adrenaline can be given if it's available and if there's no response to it after five minutes. The patient will need to go to hospital and be monitored for up to four hours after any anaphylactic reaction. This is the action plan that we can make use of when somebody is either experiencing an allergic reaction or is experiencing anaphylaxis. This action plan has been created by the Australian Society of Immunology and Allergy and they can be accessed from www.allergy.org.au. These action plans were designed to help the general public in recognizing the mild to moderate allergic reaction and recognizing anaphylaxis. There are two types of action plans available on the market. The one that we see in front of us is the red and blue action plan, which is the personal action plan. This is the personal action plan and is quite easy to identify because there is a column on the left hand side of the action plan which contains the personal details of the patient. The general use action plan is orange and blue and it does not have a column on the left hand side with any personal details on it. That's because they can be used on any person whether or not they have been identified to have allergies or anaphylaxis before. The personal use ASEA action plan needs to be completed by the person's treating doctor and for a mild to moderate reaction they may actually prescribe some type of antihistamine medication to help relieve the mild or moderate signs and symptoms. But it's important to understand that antihistamines are only helpful for the mild to moderate reaction. They do not stop anaphylaxis from occurring. The only thing that can stop anaphylaxis is adrenaline, which is made available through use of the EpiPen. The ASEA action plan is divided into two sections. The first top section over here, all in blue, is how to recognize the signs and symptoms of a mild to moderate allergic reaction, as well as the actions to take place if somebody is experiencing a mild to moderate reaction. And then the second section, which is all colored in red, gives the signs and symptoms for anaphylaxis and the actions to take when somebody is experiencing an anaphylactic reaction. And as we can see on the page here, it first says to lay the person flat, do not allow them to stand or walk, give the EpiPen, telephone the ambulance services, then contact the family or emergency contact. Further adrenaline doses may be given if there's no response after five minutes. To transfer the patient to hospital for four hours of observations, it's important that at any time if the patient becomes unresponsive and is not breathing or not breathing normally that we need to commence CPR. 
And in the bottom left hand section over here, it gives clear instructions on how to administer the adrenaline through the use of the EpiPen. The EpiPen is an auto-injector device which contains a single dose of adrenaline that can be administered in the case of an anaphylactic reaction. There are two EpiPens on the market. One is an EpiPen for older children and adults, so anybody over the age of 5 years or over 20 kgs can have a normal EpiPen, whereas the EpiPen Junior, which contains a smaller dose of adrenaline, can be used for any child under the age of 5 or under 20 kilograms. When using the EpiPen, the first thing we need to do is remove the EpiPen out of its plastic container, form a fist around the EpiPen and pull off the blue safety cap. You should not touch the orange tip as this contains the needle. Place the orange tip to the mid outer thigh on the patient there is no need to swing or jab at the patient as this could cause somebody to get frightened and jump away and this could discharge the adrenaline before it's injected into the person's leg. There's also no need to do this as the auto injectors have got a spring loaded coil inside so all we need to do is press down firmly and the needle will be injected into the person's leg. The EpiPen may be administered through a light clothing layer, so a single layer of clothing is absolutely fine. Ensure that you push down hard until you hear a loud click. You may even feel a little bit of a recoil and hold the EpiPen in place for 3 seconds to ensure that all the adrenaline has been administered into the leg. When you remove the EpiPen, the orange safety cap will move over the needle making sure that everybody is protected. The EpiPen is a single use only, so in order to administer any further adrenaline, we would need to obtain more EpiPens. Here is some important information regarding EpiPens. The EpiPen auto-injectors contain only one dose of adrenaline and is for a single use only. They must be kept under 25 degrees but not refrigerated. They can occasionally be in a warmer environment, however not for prolonged periods of time. They should be stored out of direct sunlight and they should be readily accessible and not kept behind a locked cabinet. Have a system in place that ensures EpiPens are checked regularly for expiry dates and clarity. Ensure the school or childcare center has a general use EpiPen kept in the first aid kit. For all students participating in this course, during the practical face-to-face -face training, you will get the opportunity to practice recognizing the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and making use of the EpiPen and the ASEA action plans. For those of you who are enrolled in the HLT AID 004 Provide Emergency First Aid Response in an Education and Care setting, you will be required to go through an anaphylaxis risk assessment and management plan. This will involve identifying a person at risk, identifying the risk, assessing the risk, implementing strategies to minimize the risk, determine location of medication and action plans, communicate the policies and procedures to all staff, implement the new policies and how to monitor and review policies. For this next section, we're going to have an overview of different general medical conditions, starting with febrile convulsions. Febrile seizures or convulsions are usually associated with a fever in children. These seizures usually occur between the ages of 6 months to 5 years. Seizures are usually due to an underlying infection, such as diarrhea or vomiting bug or other high fever illnesses. Most seizures will last less than 5 minutes, but some can range up to 15 minutes. Signs and symptoms will include hot and sweaty skin, stiffness and rigidity of the body when they have the convulsion, difficulty in breathing and foaming at the mouth, Cyanosis, which is the color blue, especially around the lips, rolling of the eyes, and drowsiness after the fit. The treatment for febrile convulsions is to follow our DRS ABCD and call for triple zero. Do not attempt to restrain the child. Ensure that the child is safe and remove them from any obstacles that could injure them. Note the time that the fit starts and that stops, and once the fit is stopped, place the child in the recovery position and make them comfortable. 
and remove any excess clothing and cool the child with a damp cloth. A heart attack is when there is a blockage in the blood vessel supplying the heart with blood. When there's a blockage there, there is either a decrease or a stopping of blood flow to that section of the heart. This can cause signs and symptoms such as severe chest pain, sweating, nausea, shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing, and anxiety. Treatment involves resting the patient in a half-seated position, DRS, ABCD, and call for assistance. Monitor the patient closely and calm and reassure. A stroke is also called a CVA, a cerebrovascular accident, but it's more commonly known as stroke. A stroke is a bleed or a blood clot on the brain which interrupts the blood flow to that part of the brain. Signs and symptoms include facial weakness, arm weakness, speech difficulties or slurred speech, confusion, headache, memory loss and one-sided paralysis. You may have seen this advertisement on buses or in medical centers before, this acronym called FAST. F stands for face, as we've mentioned, facial weakness is one of the symptoms. A stands for assessing the arms, looking for arm weakness. S is assessing for speech. Do they have any speech difficulties or is there any slurred speech? And T means time to act fast. That means call triple zero and get this patient off to hospital as soon as possible. The treatment for a stroke involves doing your DRS ABCD, position the patient in a half seated position if they are conscious or if they're unconscious, place them in the recovery position. Monitor the patient very closely and calm and reassure. A seizure is a disturbance of electrical activity in the brain. Seizures can be caused by conditions such as epilepsy, head injuries, diabetes, hyperthermia or high temperatures, alcohol and drug abuse, and febrile convulsions, which we've mentioned already with our infants and children. Signs and symptoms in seizures can vary quite a lot. You get two main different types of seizures. One is called partial seizures and the other is generalized. A partial seizure means that it's a seizure that only affects one part of the body. So you may see just some convulsion movement or jerky movements in the person's hand or arms only and the rest of their body is fine. Whereas a generalized seizure is when the whole body is involved in the seizure and it usually results in unresponsiveness or unconsciousness. Patients can re-experience jerky movements or muscular contractions, thrashing of limbs, unresponsiveness or unconsciousness. The patient may go blue around the lips or cyanosed, and they could be frothing at the mouth. When treating or managing a seizure, conduct a DRS ABCD and call for help. Do not attempt to restrain the patient. Move any obstacles away from the patient and keep them safe. Observe what happens during the seizure and how long the seizure takes. After the seizure, put the patient into the recovery position and monitor them closely. Be aware that after the seizure, the patient can be very tired and may not regain full consciousness for a while. And please ensure that nothing is ever placed inside the patient's mouth during or after a seizure, as this can cause an upper airway obstruction. Diabetes is a medical condition whereby the body has lost the ability to effectively regulate the blood glucose levels. There are two types of medical emergencies which occur because of diabetes. One is hypoglycemia, meaning that there's low blood sugar levels, and one is called hyperglycemia, which is meaning high blood sugar levels. Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia result in somebody sweating profusely, their skin temperature is cool, and if you ask them when they last had a meal, you will most likely find that they have missed the last meal, resulting in not enough sugar in the bloodstream. In contrast to that, somebody who's got hyperglycemia, meaning high blood sugar levels, their skin could be dry and hot, and if you ask them about when they had their last meal, you would find that they would most likely not have missed one, but they may have missed taking their medications. The treatment for a diabetic patient is to do our DRS ABCD and give the patient something sugary to eat or drink if the patient is conscious. 
We never assist the diabetic patient with administering their medication as this can become very dangerous. This is something only to be done by a nurse practitioner or a doctor. In the event of a drowning victim, remove the victim from the water as soon as possible, but do not endanger your safety in doing so. Conduct a DRS ABCD with the patient in the lateral or recovery position and call for help. We do our DRS ABCD in the lateral or recovery position to clear any fluids that could be in the airway. If the patient is unconscious and not breathing, commence CPR straight away. If the patient is conscious, Keep them in the recovery position and monitor the airway and breathing. Remove any cold or wet clothes from the patient, dry the patient and attempt to keep them warm. Hypothermia is a condition where the body's core temperature drops below 35 degrees. The body's normal temperature is about 36.6 or 37 degrees Celsius. However, when the body drops below that and becomes too cold, it starts to malfunction and can produce signs and symptoms such as unexpected or unreasonable behavior. The patient then becomes very lethargic mentally and physically. They may get slurred speech or be unable to communicate properly, sudden fits of shivering or violent outbursts of energy. And as the condition worsens, this can result in a falling or slow pulse rate and an alteration or a loss of consciousness. The treatment for hypothermia is to conduct our DRS ABCD and call for assistance. Prevent any further heat loss by insulating the patient with warm, dry materials. Remove the person from the cold environment, especially wind and rain, and rewarm the person by either using a hypothermia rescue blanket or place the person into a sleeping bag with a companion who can warm them up through body heat. Place hot water bottles or chemical heat bags into the groin area, armpits and on the sides of the neck in order to rewarm the body and bring that body temperature back up to normal. With hyperthermia, this is a condition whereby the body's core temperature raises higher than normal and the body starts to malfunction. Hyperthermia can cause three of the following conditions, heat cramps, heat exhaustion or heat stroke. The signs and symptoms vary from abdominal cramping, hot dry skin, headaches, dizziness and vomiting, to sudden fatigue, feeling like urinating but inability to do so, and a decreased level of consciousness. Treatment for hypothermia consists of our DRS ABCD and calling for assistance. Move the patient to a cool shady area remove any unnecessary clothing and cool the person by sponging with water or a damp cloth. Give small sips of staminate or similar electrolyte replacement drinks and assist to stretch any cramped muscles. If ever in doubt, seek medical assistance. That concludes our section on medical emergencies. Please be aware that when you conduct your face-to-face -face training, you will be required to go through several scenarios where you as the first aid provider or caregiver will need to recognize what medical or trauma emergency it is and follow the procedures to manage the patient appropriately. So make sure that you feel comfortable in recognizing and managing each of the medical emergencies that we have spoken about in this online training section. Thank you for joining us for this online training session in medical emergencies. Here are some other available courses presented by paramedical services.